everybody. Welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 58. And today we're going to be telling you about a company called CERN and conspiracies around it, including getting into a little bit of like the Mandela effect. Yeah, yeah. And just some like really trippy shit. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of really interesting conspiracies and just interesting things that this organization called CERN is doing. And it'll fucking blow your mind. Get ready. Yep. yep. It's going to do that. Before we get started, though, I do want to thank our first guest, Kathleen Lights, for appearing on our podcast. Kathleen is so awesome. And, you know, shout out to all of you guys who are really, really supportive of our first guest. It was kind of nerve wracking to have just another person in because we're used to, and we're married yeah. so we're used to talking to each other and true, very we're true. used to interrupting each other and like we you know <laughs> we like have learned how to talk with each other but with someone else we were nervous about how it went and it went really well and it was you know really well received by you guys and just you know thanks you guys to, for being welcome welcoming to kathleen yeah no absolutely i just yeah. thought it was really fun so it was really we fun. plan to have a lot more guests in the future yes that's that's the goal now is to start booking some you know, interesting guests, maybe some other YouTubers as well mm-hmm. that are interested in these subjects. So and just some experts. Yeah, exactly. We're hoping to get some experts. Some experts on some of these topics. Yes, yeah, so nice it was really get... fun with Kathleen. And yes. yes, we love Kathleen. You're probably listening now. Yes, what up, we do. girl? <laughs> Thanks for coming. But anyways, let's go ahead and jump right into today's uh, news topics for you. So this was a new story coming out of California this uh, a week or so ago. And it's it's very terrible and just sad all at the same time and alarming (laughs) it's wild honestly so basically in san joaquin county an elementary school has a giant cell phone tower on the property now if you know anything about cell phone towers and radiation and stuff clearly having a cell phone tower literally like on top of the school pretty much is going to have some effects on the kids there. And it really is. Um, if you're not watching the YouTube video, it it pretty much is like on top of the school, like not actually on top of it, but it's like, it's, it's like on next to property, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not just like on the property though, like off, off, you know, the side of the playground. It's like right in front of the building, like next to the building. Yeah. Which is wild, really, because yeah. you don't usually see that. But the thing about it is there's four kids at this school who now have cancer like all kind of within the same age and you know it's it's clear that there's something that could be causing all these kids from like the same school to get cancerous tumors so parents are fucking pissed they want this thing taken down so that's how they're figuring that's how they are guessing that it's all connected is because they all have tumors right cancerous yeah. tumors like the same specific type of tumor probably yeah well, so they've realized right. it's something that would be caused by radiation, I'm guessing. Yeah, exactly. Well, the doctor said that they indicated the type of cancer that these children have is because they were exposed to something in the environment. So and the doctor thinks it's 100 percent something in the environment that caused it. So, again, 100 percent. We don't know if it was the cell tower or if it was something at these kids houses. But I mean, come on. I mean, it'll be interesting to see. If down the road, if more kids end up getting sick because of this i, I mean, know if four if, already you've got it then what would you do if it was like if your kid was just going to the school like i would want to go have them get a brain scan i would be like four other kids have this so someone better scan my child yeah absolutely like and i would be freaking out if i were the other parents too yeah like, I, what if I they would have be, small tumors starting that's that's the thing right is it's possible that you know they may not have cancer full-blown right now but it could be something developing yeah definitely to something anybody that in the school develop in their later life as well yeah well it's wow. also because um kids are at that early age are more susceptible to radiation and things like that so the chances of them getting cancer versus like why haven't the teachers got it you know why haven't adults got it? it's because technically mm-hmm. it, you know it wasn't illegal for sprint who's the company to put the cell tower on the elementary school property because they i guess they do that uh, a lot because they give a kickback to the school district like two thousand bucks a month to put their cell tower on their property and of course the schools are just desperate seem like a for lot. money like most yeah. school districts are barely getting by these days exactly so so that's a decent amount yeah god two thousand for the whole district it's like crazy that's like not enough well yeah for the whole district for, for having a potentially uh, hazardous cell tower on the property yeah, that's really bad 
But what's interesting is that um, a electromagnetic radiation specialist says that these frequencies can have effect on, on the cells of children because they're still growing and developing. He said, quote unquote, I wouldn't send my kids there at all. It's, it is absolutely as dangerous. Children are still developing and their cells are still being divided. It's the worst possible time in their life to be exposed. Oh my gosh, that's terrifying. So this particular signal, instead of going only like 300 yards like regular Wi-Fi, this particular antenna can go 30 miles. So this is an extremely wow. strong signal, Powerful. clearly. Wow. Which there's actually not, there's a cell teller that's not too far from us, actually. That is like this? Yeah. Or it's I mean, just a general I mean, cell tower? No, they're all like this, though. If you, oh. if you live anywhere near a cell tower, I mean, you're, there's... If you think about it, there's all these radio waves and frequencies and, you know, radiation happening. So is that happening right just off our phones? Yeah. I mean, that's at the end of the day, there's but again, it's about the amount of radiation and ultimately how harmful that is to you. Like, I'm not a scientist, but I do know that you like it's the same reason you can go through scans and things like that. Like your body can take radiation, but yeah, it's not good for you. I mean, at right. the end of the day, I don't think any level of radiation is good for the body. Right. But as an older individual, when your cells aren't dividing like you are as a kid or as much as a kid, then it's doesn't do as much harm potentially is what they're saying. But at the end of the day, it's not not great. No, any sort of antennas, routers, but we all need that for Wi-Fi. We need, we've got wireless yeah. signals flying around all over the place. But I sleep with my phone like in the bed all the time. Sometimes I'm like, that must be it's so really bad. bad to sleep right next to your head. Sometimes, <laughs> like your okay, phone. I used to like if I didn't have headphones and I wanted to listen to something as I fall asleep, I would just like put my phone on really low and just like literally set it under my ear and like fall asleep. Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> no, I mean, there's a lot of studies that show people that have prolonged use of phones next to their ears like you're just radiating your brain but i've heard isn't it like worse when you're actually on a call versus if you're just using well yeah like you're I browsing think, right. and stuff the, there's different types of signals so there's like rf right. signal which is the what's coming uh coming across so yeah obviously i think it's worse when you're actually on the phone and you're using those cell signals so versus cell a tower that's signal. always using is always routing calls and stuff Oh, Sorry, I'm just, like, I have no it's technical. Pumping out. Language. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just pumping out. Signal so near constantly. school, it would be way worse. Absolutely. Interesting. Actually, now that I think about it, I think there's a cell tower up by the elementary school that's like up the street from us. Uh -huh. Um, Up near the major road up there. There's I'm pretty sure I've seen like up on the hill. There's a cell tower. Then below it is a school like that's crazy. Well, if you think about it, it there's, you know, reasons why cancer rates continue to to rise in, in a lot of ways and maybe that's not true for all of them but are we so you know allowing ourselves to be susceptible more so to cancer because we are using all these you know wireless devices and Probably. cell phone signals and stuff but like literally everything what causes are you gonna do? cancer yeah like it's crazy ain't that the truth <laughs> <sighs> literally everything so scary world people so these poor kids' parents are are freaking out. Oh Obviously, God, they're sending letters imagine. to the school district, telling them to take the cell towers down because the frequencies are below federal standards. They should definitely. I'm surprised they haven't come down yet. If there's four kids with tumors, that's kind of crazy. Yeah. No, I know. I honestly, I, I might end up pulling my kid out of there if if it's literally. Oh, I would. Having that fast of an impact, like I mean, I get oh, four kids. I would pull my kid out immediately if they weren't going to take it down. And it's not like Fuck that. four kids over like a number of years. This is like four kids all at once type of thing. There could be more. Yeah. So, so, so the other kind of part to this is that I'm sure all of us have seen the Verizon commercials and how they say 5G is coming. You know, you see 5G. We are on 4G LTE right now, which is just basically the, the type of network it is, the speeds so, that it can okay, produce. Okay, so help someone like me. When cell phones first came out, were we on like 1G? Started, yeah, it started at... 1G yeah. and then is that what does that stand for? Uh, G I forget. Oh, doesn't matter. Yeah. Whatever. Who cares? I'm not, I'm not. I'm not an expert on cell signal. It's a totally know, okay, different but world. You know more shit than I do. <laughs> so then we went to 2G. I remember getting 3G. I think it's gigabit. I'm pretty sure. I remember getting 3G. Yeah, exactly. And then we got yeah, we did get four. So we're getting five. Yes. Okay. So yeah, so they're coming out. They're Who's obviously they just like Verizon or all, all the networks. Well, if you if you know that all the networks they use each other's cell towers. 
Oh. He, all the cell towers are used by all the networks pretty much. So then how come some networks are covered in certain areas and some aren't? Because those networks don't pay for the to use oh, the towers in those areas. Oh, I, I mean, see. And, or they don't have access to it. I didn't it. know that. I always yeah. thought everyone had their own towers. No, because that's why you have all these other providers that are like, we use Sprint's network, like... I forget the names right now, but like Boost Mobile and stuff, they use yeah. they piggyback off of other networks. At the end of the day, they're the exact you're gonna get the exact same coverage and signal as Sprint or whatever it is. Wow, interesting. So, but the thing with five G is it's a totally new cellular uh, technology that's gonna be installed all over the United States and Europe, and hundreds of scientists have been studying the impact of RF radiation on health, warning that five G is very dangerous. Yet wireless companies are still proceeding to install this. So 5G will substantially increase exposure to radio frequency electromagnetic fields on top of the 2G, 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi, etc. And the harmful effects of this new signal have, uh, or actually more than 230 scientists from 41 countries have expressed serious concerns regarding uh, this new 5G rollout. They said the effects include increased cancer risk, cellular stress, increase in harmful free radicals, genetic damages, structural and functional damages of the reproductive system, learning and memory deficits, neurological disorders, and negative impacts on general well-being in humans. Oh, my God. We're so fucked. And it goes way beyond humans, too. It affects animals and plants. That's how strong the signal is, because the idea with 5G is to cover it blanketed across all of us and like what do you mean like, like they're it'll gonna just have, have coverage so, everywhere yeah so they're gonna install antennas like all over the place literally in neighborhoods on they're small they can be put on top of like telephone poles and power you know power poles things like that and they're just gonna blanket them everywhere so that there's there's basically wireless and and internet access everywhere which is good you know everybody's gonna have internet access and it's going to be really fast. The speeds are going to be faster. The range is going to be better. But at the same time, it's creating like this mesh network of just RF radiation covering everybody, essentially. Oh, that's really scary. And there's legitimate health concerns about it, yet they're not doing anything and nobody, nobody's really doing anything. They're, they're just moving ahead with it. I just have a feeling that we're going to have to like learn before. That's how it, it always goes. Like something has to go wrong before we understand that it's not worth it to have 5g like people will have to get sick for them to understand they're not gonna i mean all they care about is money right and i mean if there's not like and that's the thing is a lot of people aren't even gonna know the the risks of 5g whatsoever like they don't yeah. tell they're not yeah. like a prescri prescription commercial where they give you the, the list of side effects to this medication. No. Most people won't even know they're on 5G versus no. 4G. And no. even if you decide to opt out of 5G, right. you can't because no. it's everywhere it's around, around you. everywhere. That's really, really freaky. So like right now, the, the 4G antennas and towers, are, I think, are more spaced out. So I think 5G is just going to really like kind of blanket uh, everything in radiation. So, yeah, I mean... I don't know the full other side to it. Obviously, there's probably some things that are being done to prevent this harmful radiation, I would hope, <laughs> maybe. But I don't know. I mean, you never know with the corporations what they're going to do. It's, they don't seem to care about, you know, our health. So, yeah, pretty, uh, pretty disturbing. And you know what else is disturbing? Yeah. The new climate change report. The, yeah. So... <laughs> This sucks. Yeah. So more uh, gloomy news. Damn. This should be the gloomy news podcast. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I try to find good stuff, but there's, it's just been well, the like, most important stories are the most, it, I mean, they're the, the most, most important impact things to you. talk about. Yeah. So literally it's at this point, <laughs> no matter what happens, if we were to stop warming up the environment and climate change today, hundred percent stop it. The future of the Arctic and the poles is going to be far different than it is today. And it's going to be completely changed, which will change the entire planet. Basically, the new paper uh, from the UN stays, or states that if we pull the plug on all carbon emissions tomorrow, our hands are ultimately tied. The Arctic region is still going to warm up by up to five degrees Celsius come the end of the century. 
Even under the terms of the Paris Agreement, the research shows that winter temperatures in the Arctic are set to rise by at least 3 degrees Celsius by 2050 and 5 to 9 degrees Celsius by 2080 compared to pre-industrial levels. So before, uh, like the Industrial Revolution stuff. So it's very, very clear that the planet is warming as a result of the greenhouse gases that we're emitting into the atmosphere. And it's literally getting to a point where it doesn't matter what we do. Mm -mm. The, the climate and the water levels are going to change radically in our lifetime, literally. I mean, actually, I don't know if I'll be alive by 2100, but, you know, our kids, our grandkids... You know, it's like it's going to be a totally different world. And I don't say I don't tell you all this to scare you. I tell it tell you this stuff so that you're aware, you know, maybe you're thinking about, you know, building your forever home on the coast. Ugh. Maybe not the best thing to do if you're planning to be there in the next 50 years. Like it's going to change. The coastlines are going to change. It's going to be completely different than it was, you know. And they don't know exactly how different. No, it's just that it's all dependent upon how fast the the pole, the poles melt, the ice caps. It's gotten really, really bad. Wow, that's really scary. And then, you know, we had the whole Paris Agreement with all the countries that were going to mm-hmm. lower. Even that is not going to even put no, a dent we'll cut in it. It, it doesn't matter. Up. We're like we too did far fuck deep. Up. We did fuck up. One recent study found that by 2050, 4 million people and around 70% of today's Arctic infrastructure could be threatened by thawing permafrost. So that's the other shitty Four thing. 4 million people? Yeah, just from the permafrost in the Arctic regions. So part of it, everything warming up is the permafrost thaws, and what's trapped under there is carbon dioxide. It helps keep it. So more, it's as soon as the permafrost thaws out, Shit's going to get real because all that carbon dioxide is getting put back into the atmosphere and all and as greenhouse gases making the planet even warmer. So it'll accelerate it to who knows what the level will be if all the, that melts. Like and how get, will that affect these four million people? People live there. People live up in the permafrost. Like if you look at well, Siberia and Russia and stuff. No, I mean, the people people aren't going to leave unless they are forced to leave. I mean, it's pretty much forcing them to leave. They're just going to stay and choose to deal with that. Well, a lot of people don't know. A lot of people don't know that the permafrost is probably going to thaw out. So it'll be like all of a sudden it's just happens. No, I I mean, I think when we get closer to that time, I mean, this is by 2050. So that's still years away from that happening. But it could slow. It's going to be a slow melt. But if it does completely melt and it releases all that carbon dioxide, then, yeah, it's going to be the temperature is going to go up. Oh, my God. And what's crazy about this is that literally, and I, I say this all the time because I swear Hollywood gives us movies to try to, like, prepare us for real life events. Yeah. I really do. I think there's some semblance there. I don't know how it works or what's, which one do you think? what the fuck's going on. But, like, Interstellar. Yeah, Interstellar. I'm, I'm telling you, I love that movie because it's I know. a great I was just movie, thinking of that, too. So, okay, just because I'm curious if, okay, so a lot of people probably haven't seen Interstellar, but how would we get from this point to where they are in like Interstellar? It's confusing. I think for people that aren't like scientists or don't understand this type of stuff are confused at why like all the ice melting will create like the wind and the like how how would we end up with conditions so, where so the weather of yes. the world is based on wording this well <laughs> josh the science guy over here you're not the science guy no. but you are the science guy of us i do love science though but you do you were very I'm good smart at science i'm pretty good at science i'll just, I'll just say science. that i'm very not good but the ocean affects mm-hmm. all all the ocean currents affect the weather where does the weather get the water if there's more water in the ocean there's more water In the lakes, it's getting put up. More precipitation creates more storms. It's going to affect the entire weather patterns of the planet if the the polar ice caps melt because it's going to raise the sea level. Temperatures are going to rise. So that warm weather, I mean, you could have fucking like hurricanes up in Iceland or something. like. You could have some crazy shit happening. I mean, that's probably pretty extreme, but (laughs) it could happen. Oh, my God. And that's the whole thing with Interstellar is like in the movie, um, they're farmers and they're, they're farming corn and... They have dust bowls. They have literally huge yeah. sandstorms happening because everything is so dry. They get no. They, but why is it dry if there's all this water? Like I'm confused. Well, it depend. If there's no water around it, then there's not going to be water. 
I mean, it's also just the winds and the air currents and stuff are all going to change too. So they're almost like, you know, it's picking up all the the dirt because the dirt's not getting enough moisture. It's not raining as much anymore. I just feel so guilty. Like, you know, talking about having children and stuff, which we want to, because I think of stuff like this, that my children are being born into this world completely Uh, innocent and have to deal with this and could die from it. Like, that's really scary. You know, I want to go as far as say die. They, co- I'm saying they could, or my grandchildren, or their children. Like it's, it feels so irresponsible. Like even having children into this mess, like when they are innocent, can't well, do anything about it. Like I've, ta- we've talked about this so many times. I still want to have kids. Right. I'm gonna have kids. I want to no, have kids. No, and I, I totally I understand with what it. you're saying. And for anybody out there that's freaking the fuck out because you're like, oh my god, this is gonna be terrible. Yeah, you like, have to also think about that. Whenever humanity has been faced with problems, and no matter how bad they are, we find a way to e- to either survive or attempt to survive, or we evolve with it. So what will happen is life as we know it today, and the change. way we travel, and the way we live, will completely change if the climate completely changes. It will have to. People mm-hmm. will not be able to live the same. It'll have to be, you know, and I mean that in the sense of the like in the literal sense of the term, like our houses could be made of something completely different. We could have to live underground on our planet because the surface is too hostile. It's too hot on the surface. We oh my can't God. we can't live or grow anything. So we gotta build underground, you know, huge civilization underground with all that or whatever. You know, it's just an example. Or at like an interstellar, you know, you start thinking about, well, shit, you know, this planet's not gonna be able to inhabit life as we know it right now so we got to go somewhere else so it's i swear like all, all the space stuff recently and all of these different things happening every week i see an article about scientists at mit working on interstellar travel literally just read an article about that like elon's talking about going to the moon uh bezos is talking about mars i mean they're 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 working on it actively like preparing civilization for living in outer space that's what's going to happen in our pro i'm predicting in our lifetime we're going to see people living full-time in outer space it's going to happen and on the moon and mars and things like that wow i think we're going to see that because i don't know it's going to get really interesting but this podcast is going to be really interesting by then (laughs) imagine the shit we'll talk about over the years guys oh my god seriously i mean (laughs) seriously just even in the next like 10 years if we were to do this podcast for 10 years about how different the episode would be 10 years from now yeah and and things are going to completely change and the the whole climate thing is going to disrupt people it's going to force people to move away from the coast Mm mm-hmm Move to Colorado, guys. Or (laughs) don't. We already have enough fucking traffic. Please don't, actually. But that's the thing is you got to think about. You got to think about. Go to Kansas. There's plenty of room, guys. I've seen it. There's nothing there. But like, yeah, these a lot of these islands are going to be underwater. A a lot of these places that we know and love are going to be gone. Like they're going to just be submerged because. I mean, and and the temperatures of the water Mm. are rising. So my grandpa owns a house in Miami and. Um, we've talked about as a family, what we're going to do with it, you know, in the future. And I don't think we'll end up keeping it. Like we've, we've pretty much realized that Miami's not going to be around forever. And, you know, sorry, Kathleen. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Well, parts For of it, you, where my grandpa Miami. lives. Yeah. All right. I mean, again, we're just speculating right now. Like we're, we don't know, obviously. Well, I mean, we're but, going off of a science. It's not yeah. just speculating. <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> it's like serious research. But I mean, I think people that live there know that like they're aware of what's going on, that the sea levels are rising. I hope people that live there are aware the sea levels are rising. <laughs> I don't know, though. I don't I think mean, a it's lot on of their people news are. and stuff, right? It's got to be on the news. Not not as much as it should. I, I, I think a lot of people are a little too optimistic about reversing climate change and yes or or how they're like oh it's only going up one or two degrees they like don't know how much yeah or like three degrees increase is not going to be a big deal we'll be fine no but you don't understand how that translates (laughs) into the planet into the entire ecosphere like it completely changes it and it's going to cause a lot of people to not have food to not have you know somewhere to live potentially i mean there's a lot of huge events that are going to happen it's mm-hmm. inevitable, I believe. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I just wanted to put that out there. And I think it's important that everybody starts just thinking about, think about your future, what you're going to do. You know, when you start getting into the, into this stuff a little bit more, you start th- thinking about what could happen. And obviously you don't want to 
live in fear and scare yourself. But at the same time, I think it's good to always think of all the possibilities because we just don't know. We just don't know. Like life is good right now, but things could completely change in the next 50 years. So who knows? Yeah. Or things will be like, I don't know. Well, I don't know. There's no way with the planet that things are going to be good. (laughs) All I know is that as soon as I can... Well, well, maybe our technology gets that good that we do figure out how to fix it. Well, that's the thing. Like, is we a, don't know how to fix it now, but maybe in 50 years. Right. That's another option is we might figure out a way to go clean up all those greenhouse gases. Mm-hmm, we mm-hmm. might figure out a way to suck it in. and Yeah. Cool, if it's really a problem, imagine how many more people will come out to help more minds right. on it. And Right. That's the when it's a crisis view of it. Absolutely. Yeah. I know. If humanity goes in the crisis, we'll all band together. Put our thinking caps on and (laughs) try to try to save the world. Ah, That'd be crazy. (laughs) But anyways, (sighs) guys, let's before we get into CERN, uh, which is also going to blow your mind. We want to thank our sponsors for today. Upstart is our first sponsor today. Applying for a loan is a lot like applying for a job and that you don't get to interview for. Instead, loan companies make their decisions based off your credit score and history without getting to know the whole you. Now, thanks to Upstart.com, it never has to be that way again. Upstart is revolutionizing the way you borrow money by rewarding you for your job experience and education in the form of a smarter interest rate, which for those of you that are starting out or in college or, you know, just working, trying to survive, you it is very hard to get loans if you don't have a good credit score. And if you are able to get a loan, then usually the interest rate is uh, really, really high. So Upstart's a great option uh, for you because unlike traditional credit underwriting, which could be biased against people with a short credit history, Upstart goes beyond the traditional FICO score when assessing your credit worthiness. Upstart believes you're more than just your credit score. They make it fast, simple, and easy to check your rate in less than two minutes without affecting your credit score. Best part, once your loan is approved, the funds will be transferred to you the very next business day. Over 100,000 have used Upstart to pay off credit cards, student loans, fund their wedding, or to even make a large purchase. Free yourself from the burden of high interest credit card debt by consolidating everything into one monthly payment with Upstart. See why Upstart is ranked number one in their category with over 300 businesses on Trustpilot and hurry to upstart.com slash mile higher to find out how low your upstart upstart rate is. Checking your rate only takes two minutes and it won't affect your credit. That's upstart.com slash mile higher. And we also want to thank our second sponsor today, Roman. Guys are terrible at taking care of their health. Whether it's a knee injury, bad back, or something worse, guys are usually more comfortable rubbing some dirt in it than seeing a doctor, which I have been guilty of myself before. Yeah, you're awful. Because I, I think for guys, just like, especially if you have a, a male doctor, you don't want to go and be like, yeah, I think this is wrong. And then they're like, dude, suck it up, man. It's not that big of a deal. I've had doctors kind of like play it off like, oh, it's probably just a, you know, headache or something or whatever. Because it probably was. <laughs> <laughs> Josh has a history of being very dramatic. <laughs> Remember when you choked on the, the corn dog stick? He like chewed on oh, a corn God. dog stick and got a little splinter in his throat and we had to go to the hospital. Oh, it's so embarrassing. They thought you were so dramatic. Or the time you got one stitch. I swear all my injuries have been such pathetic injuries. They really have. <laughs> one stitch? Yeah. Oh my He's God. He's like, do you want me to give you one stitch or I can just leave? And you're like, yeah, it's stitching up. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. In, out. All right, you're done. But anyways, anyway. back to Roman. The same is true for erectile dysfunction. Studies show 70% of guys who experience ED don't get treated for it. Thankfully, Roman created a simple, secure way to get checked out by a doctor and get treated for ED online. Roman is a one-stop shop where licensed U.S. physicians can diagnose ED and ship medication right to your door. With Roman, there are no waiting rooms, awkward face-to-face conversations, or uncomfortable trips to the pharmacy. You can handle everything discreetly online. All you have to do is visit GetRoman.com slash MileHire, fill out a brief medical onboarding chat with a doctor and get genuine medication. Delivered to your door in discreet, unmarked packaging. Guys, go get online and get checked by the doctor. Erectile dysfunction is a problem that guys don't tackle. But with Roman, it's really easy, so take care of it. For a free online visit, go to GetRoman.com slash MileHire. That's GetRoman.com slash MileHire. For a free online visit, GetRoman.com slash MileHire. Which, a lot of people don't know this, but younger guys can suffer from ED as well. It's, it's a thing. It's not just older folks. Older guys, sorry. All right. CERN. Do you know what CERN is? Oh, yeah. So CERN, what is it? It's a very interesting organization that was founded in the 1950s. And the name stood for, this is French, so get a little taste of my French right now. 
Council European Pola Researche Nucleari. Or European Council for Nuclear Research. Hmm, no. That wasn't pretty bad. Hey, that's not bad. That wasn't pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the name of the actual provisional organizi organizing body. So this organization is in Europe, clearly. Um, but it's now just known as the European Laboratory for Particle Physics. So what does that mean exactly? <laughs> CERN does particle physics, which means studying the fundamental particles or the basic constituents Space. of matter. So they're they're li they're literally researching what makes up everything. Like what is matter? What are these particles that make up matter? Because they ultimately their goal, at least what they tell us, is that they want to find out life? what the universe is and what it's made of and how it works. Yeah, like what is what life? is this? Yeah, what is this shit? Can they prove that you know? life is natural or could they perhaps prove that it's a simulation somehow if they dig deep enough and smash particles together oh, that's so crazy so the instruments that they use to to research this stuff are called particle accelerators and detectors now these accelerators boost beams of particles to high energies before they're made to collide with each other or with stationary targets i wonder like you can't probably even see this stuff like how do the scientists even I'm so confused about how they do this. Oh, I know. Well, they have a supercomputer. Oh. So it's so what they do is they shoot these beams at each other and they have a supercomputer because in order to record this type of data, you have to have a supercomputer to do it. So that's that's how they're able. It's not like they just sit there and like look through a window and like, oh, there it goes. Blah, boom. Oh, in my and head, I was is. picturing that. <laughs> Like, like sending it, two in there to all hit right. each other. Uh, looks like those particles hit each other. Oh, uh, they exploded. Okay. <laughs> no. They have special detectors that observe and record the results of these collisions. So, And from these results, the scientists are able to learn about the particle's properties, such as the mass and the charge. Now, let's get into CERN a little bit more as far as their history. So the CERN was originally set up in 1952 after being ratified by 12 founding member countries. CERN officially came into being in 1954. CERN's first accelerator. So that's their whole thing, right, is particle accelerators. That's what they're focused on. And they've had numerous different particle accelerators over the years to the current one, which is called the Large Hadron Collider. Right. I've the read LHC that one. Uh, is, the, is the abbreviation for it, which is fucking bizarre looking and huge and basically connects a bunch of tunnels and tubes together in like a track and then they race these particles around the track at literally the speed of light basically almost the speed of light and then they smash into each other because they're trying to literally recreate different conditions yeah. of the universe to figure it out aren't they trying to create a black hole yeah yeah well they they have created quantum black holes not cosmological black holes a lot so of people like, are confused about that yeah but it's a micro black it's a hole. micro black hole but it's so small that it doesn't do anything it collapses almost immediately as soon as it forms yeah weird and it's not in the same sense that you think of a black hole out in space it's not the same type of thing mm -hmm. we have to in order to do something like that it would require much yeah. much 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 more energy yeah, we literally have to create like a Dyson sphere. You know, we've talked about yes. that, like a giant structure around our star to, to utilize what a Dyson the Dyson sphere is because now you're going to confuse people. So a, so a Dyson sphere <laughs> is a theoretical idea of creating a giant structure, man-made structure around a star in order to harness its full energy potential. Mm -hmm. So think of almost like a Death Star type yeah. thing. If you're familiar with Star Wars, Take you know, the life out of a star. Exactly. Except it's inside of that Death Star is an actual like star that they're sucking energy from. So that's that's basically what they're doing. So over the years, they've built different particle colliders um, and making them bigger and bigger, um, huge tunnels underground. And in 1995 or I'm sorry, in 1990, CERN scientist Tim Berners Lee invented the World Wide Web, actually. Oh, wow. Yeah. They're, they're responsible for creating the World Wide Web, which a lot of people don't know. Interesting. Which is not the same thing as the Internet, right? The Internet is the actual yeah. network versus the web is the way to access the information on the Internet. Okay. Like web pages and hyperlinks. So he created that. Okay. 
And then in 1995, CERN made the first antimatter atoms, and they were anti-hydrogen atoms. There were nine of them. They only lasted about 40 billionths of a second before annihilating with ordinary matter. Since then, they've created thousands of more. They're literally like creating atoms and stuff. They're creating life. <laughs> God, what they're, it's so crazy what they're doing. It is. It's really mind-blowing. There's like nothing else like CERN out there. No, not not with the capabilities that they have. And that's why it's run by 20 different European member states. It's not owned by any particular entity. I was just about to ask entity. who owns yep. it. Okay. So the current members are Austria, Belgium, uh, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, Greece, Hungary, Italy, the Netherlands, Norway, Poland, Portugal, the Slavic Republic, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, and the UK. So most of most of Europe. And they they share the facilities with different different scientists. They actually employ over 2,500 people, and they have 8,000 visiting scientists. Wow. Half of the world's particle physicists come to CERN for their research, which makes wow. sense because of the equipment they have. I mean, they have yeah. the most advanced. God, imagine being a particle physicist. You have to be so smart to want to do that. That's so crazy. That sounds like <laughs> to study, <horrible. laughs> To spend all of your schooling and time studying something you can't theoretically see. Oh, that would drive me insane. You can't even see it. You have to. They must see the world so differently in their head, too. Oh, they yeah. know so much. Oh, so oh yeah. So let's talk about <laughs> CERN's Large Hadron Collider. So deep under the border of Switzerland and France, there's this massive ring shaped installation which blasts these particles into one another at incredible speeds. And scientists observe these collisions, allowing them to observe the impossibly small particles, which essentially make up the fabric of reality. For a moment of time. And this large Hadron Collider has provided them with tons of insight into the physical makeup of our universe, trying to figure that out, what makes the universe tick. So if you're watching this on YouTube, which you should watch on YouTube, because I've put in some uh, pictures and things like that of, of this thing, because it literally is these giant tunnels underground and they have to keep it underground because of the cooling, uh, which would make sense. But there's literally like tons and tons and tons of tunnel running through these um this underground area oh, that's crazy so the large hadron collider was constructed between 1998 and 2008 and began its first operational run in november 20 2009 following a year-long delay due to an incident where an electrical fault resulted in several tons of liquid helium coolant being vented into the tunnel that's not good Ooh, liquid helium mm -hmm. did you like suck that up and go Talk all correct. Liquid uh, helium, I'm pretty sure helium would probably fucking kill you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but this project costs a staggering nine billion dollars to construct. It's the most wow. expensive machine ever built. It's also the world's largest machine. It's so big. It looks like the space station. It really looks trippy. It reminds me of like what a like a portal would look like to me, which we'll talk about. This that looks more. like out of a movie. Like this Doesn't would be it? in like Dr. Evil's lab in Austin Powers. Yeah, if you haven't seen it, it's like this almost geometric looking like giant cylinder that almost looks like it has like an entrance to it in a way, even though it doesn't technically. But then it connects up all to all these tunnels. So the actual CERN Collider Complex is buried at 575 feet below the surface or 175 meters down below. And the tunnel complex runs along 17 mile circuit. That's how long the circuit is 17 miles. They've dug underground and built this out. Scientists involved in projects say the laboratory was built underground because of the earth's crust provides protection against the radiation. And they also say that it's buried out of respect for the natural landscape, which is kind of ironic considering the massive damage this thing could do if something goes wrong down the road. So these particle beams, which they shoot at ultra high speeds, are launched with about 13 tera electron volts of combined energy, resulting in unbelievably dense particles that are about 1 million times hotter than the sun's core. That's crazy. They're creating temperature. Mind around that. Like the temperatures that they create are really mind blowing. How is that even possible? About. Wouldn't it melt anything that they have? No. What? We have an ability to do that. What? Mm -hmm. That's so crazy. It's it's wow. I can't even understand that. That's they have so to cool hot. It. They cool it, but it's also that far underground because it's that hot. Like think about how hot the fucking sun is, you guys. Like you can feel it from your 
backyard standing out there and it's it's thousands of miles away from you millions yeah millions duh. trillions i think it's yeah like so many miles away and you can still feel it on your skin you can feel the warmth of it like a fire in front like you're in front of a yeah, fire yeah yeah that's how hot that shit is and for them to be creating temperatures hotter than that of the <laughs> core of the sun mm -hmm. that is mind-blowing it is how's that possible I don't know. Aren't they man. scared? I'd be like scared to yeah. work there. Oh the yeah. Fuck? Seriously. Can you imagine what could go wrong? Yeah. So oh, I can imagine what could go wrong for sure. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of things that could go wrong. I would have so much anxiety working there. Oh my God. But when they're shooting these particles through these uh, tunnels and on this 17 mile loop, there's 1600 magnets, which curve and direct the beams around the massive tunnel and into one another. A beam might rotate for up to 10 hours traveling a distance of more than 10 billion kilometers oh enough to make God. it to the far reaches of our solar system and back again. That's insane. This is like, this is literally a super machine. This is something yes. that is more powerful than anything on the planet. Yes. As far as we know, could be like in the universe, even that, that, um, cigar shaped spaceship that we're not yeah. sure if it's a rock or a spaceship. What is that? Uma Uma. Yeah. Um, that was is not moving that fast through the solar system. No, no, then like, we wouldn't see it if yeah. it was moving that fast. It this was is, like days. This is moving at like nearly light speed. That's incredible. These beams are. Wow. And then smashing in together. Because what, like, ultimately, what they're trying to do is God, these people must be smart. Create the conditions <laughs> of the Big Bang. Like as soon as a Big Bang happened. They're trying to create those conditions of, of like what, what the if they current create universe a, like, like miniature universe. <laughs> Who knows what they could do? Oh my gosh. It's it's absolutely so insane. So this is interesting. So some of the discoveries that this large hadron collider have made are are truly mind blowing. So currently we use the standard model of particle physics to explain how particle physics works. The standard model, which was formulated over the course of the 20th century by various scientists, has thus remained consistent in explaining parts of the universe directly observable to us, which is only about 5% of the universe is what is observable to us. How crazy is that? We, we can only see 5% of the universe, which leaves the remaining 95% of the universe unaccounted for in the standard model, which is the standard that a lot of scientists use to explain the universe and like how much we can see in the universe. So there's oh 90, ninety-five percent that's not even observable. We have no fucking clue what it is or what what's holding it all together. We can and only people see really think part. we're the only beings out here. Hey, this is a, that's the a, only motherfuckers here. No way, no way. <laughs> yeah, that's laughable. Honestly, there's no way. God. So this is where the idea of dark matter and dark energy comes from, which they're trying to really figure out what that is. It's just kind of a term that's been coined to this unexplainable 95% unit of the universe. Okay. Well, it's dark energy, right? Cause you can't, because it's not can't observable. Why I'm is it not sure observable? Because we, we can't see it. We, we can't, I don't it's know. Too we, far. we no, it's not cause it's too far. It's just, we don't know what it's literally the fabric of our reality. That's what we're, that's what they're trying to discover is what is this 95% that we can't see, but it's clearly there because it's holding it all together. We know it's bigger than what we can see because we can measure what we can see. Okay. You know, they've, they've been able to kind of measure a part of the observable universe. Have you ever seen that? Uh, so, you, map so they're talking about like different dimensions and stuff then too. We don't know. I mean, that's the thing is like you can even ask some of them smartest astrophysicists, Neil deGrasse Tyson, about dark energy and stuff. And we don't know. We don't know what this it hurts is. My brain. It could be computer code. It could be literally just, yeah, dimension upon dimension upon dimension. But then what's holding the dimensions together? What's holding it? What's the fabric of the universe is essentially what it is. Wow. Yeah. So that we know what we know a lot. But at the same time, we don't know shit as far as what is actually out there holding it all together. We can, you know, we're starting to discover there's other dimensions and there's other layers to the universe, but we don't know what it is that even is holding it all together. What's keeping the universe. I'm like a little mind blown right now. I feel like I can't even like apart. talk. That's insane. We don't know what we don't know what 
the forces are at play you said? that are keeping it together. Did you say 90 or 95? 95. That's fucking crazy. Unobservable. That makes me feel very scared. <laughs> and very small. Yes, very small. We are very, we are very tiny. small. Anybody that takes himself too seriously, oh, I encourage seriously. you to look into this because it, it makes you feel, brings you back to reality yeah, a little bit. I'm having bit. one of those moments right now. I'm just like, damn. And, and it just shows you this? like science knows a lot. But science doesn't know a lot either. They don't know they don't most. Know, they don't know most <laughs> yeah. of the truth about what it is that makes the universe tick. I know. It's, it's crazy that most people think scientists know pretty much everything there is to know. No, yeah. not even People close. think it's like all been figured out. No. So far from that. My God. Wow. How interesting. So, yeah. So that's, that's basically... Um, what the standard model is the people have different theories about this and some people don't even think dark matter or dark energy is is a thing but this is kind of the standard among scientists but what's crazy is that even with that standard model it doesn't even account for gravity and it's incompatible with the theory of relativity so that's take that those two things away then we, we really don't know it just creates even more questions which if you don't know exactly like what gravity is it's the force that's holding us to the planet right it's keeping us from from flying off of it <laughs> if you don't know what gravity is <laughs> like the, it's the force struggling between two bodies so even at the center of the earth is pulling you toward it keeping you firmly lodged to the ground mind you yeah not flying into space your center of mass however is pulling you back at the earth so you're pulling back but the earth's gravity is stronger than your gravity if your gravity was stronger you could pull away from the earth and just completely float away from it <laughs> wow That's but the crazy. earth keeps us firmly rooted here there's like stay here wow well thank thank you gravity so then this idea of the theory of relativity which albert einstein came up with and if you don't understand or even know what the theory of relativity is i'll give you try to give you a simple explanation so in this theory, he determined that the laws of physics are the same for all non-accelerating observers, and he showed that the speed of light within a vacuum is the same no matter the speed at which an observer travels. As a result, he found that space and time were interwoven into a single continuum known as space-time. Okay, let's repeat those just slower. <laughs> okay. Sure. So in Albert Einstein's theory of relativity, he just determined that the laws of physics, so Newton's laws of physics, okay. are the same for a non-accelerating observer. And he showed that the speed of light within a vacuum, so space is a vacuum, is the same no matter the speed at which an observer travels. As a result, he found that space and time were interwoven into a single continuum known as space-time. Events that occur at the same time for one observer could occur at different times for another. Which is, if you think about this, the way that I think about this is... Um, or actually here, let me just give you an example. So as he worked out the equations for this general theory of relativity, he realized that massive objects caused a distortion in space time. So if you think of space and then you think of the earth in space. So a good example is like you put a large or heavy body at the, at the center of a trampoline. Okay. Okay. Like a bowling ball at the center of the trampoline. It's going to create a slight dip or slant slope. slope to the trampoline, right? So anything you put outside on that on the trampoline is going to move towards the middle, right? Yeah. So so that's the idea of it, of it being um <laughs> I'm blowing my own mind as I'm talking about this. <laughs> Sorry. So if you were to roll a marble around the edge, it would spiral inward toward the body, pulling in much the same way that gravity of a planet pulls at rocks in space. Interesting. So it's pulling. It wouldn't just like stuff. go in. It would spin around. Yeah, it would move around it. Yeah, I mean, a marble on a trampoline would eventually go to the middle. Okay. But if you think about a body, it's going. That's why it's going to move around the object, which is why we understand planets rotate around things. Okay. But it's also like we've talked about UFOs and their abilities. You know, if there's these types of flying saucer craft, anti gravity craft. Yeah. They're able to, basically put a hole in space time, which is what all of it is out there and move through space time and disappear at one point and appear at another and virtually no time has passed. So to us, it looks like they went here, but to them, there was no change in time. It's so confusing. It's very confusing. Is it's that like about a wormhole? 
sort of, yeah, sort of a, an idea like that. Oh my gosh, that's so trippy. Space time is the hardest concept to understand. Yeah. I would love to get like a astrophysicist or somebody yes. that really understands this that yeah. could put Guys, we're really it, hoping it that Oh yeah, for sure. I I'm mean, gonna, we're yeah, just I'm doing our best with like Google. <laughs> yeah, no. We're like, you know, doing our own research. Josh is our our scientist here. <laughs> um, but yeah, it would be awesome to get someone who could really try to explain this to us. Wouldn't it be great to have someone like I don't know. Just like someone that works at one of these places, like someone that works at CERN, but I'm sure they couldn't tell us anything, right? They probably couldn't even talk about a lot of this. Yeah, probably not. It's so interesting though. I would love to hear like what a daily thing, what their day is like. Like, oh yeah, just fucked with some gravity this morning, made a black hole after lunch. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> like, oh my God. What an interesting day. Yep. Worked on some time travel shit around three and then headed home. Or can you imagine <laughs> being the person that like shoots off the, the particle beam? Yeah. Oh no! Like, and it's like, all right. If I push this, too. it's gonna start up this whole fucking, fucking literally. Thing. Yeah. Like, what if it goes wrong and it just all explodes or something? Oh shit! Yeah, it's gonna be bad. <sighs> oh, oh, that's scary. So the so the other thing that um, CERN's Large Hadron Collider has confirmed the existence of is called Higgs boson, which is the God particle which is an important theoretical aspect of the standard model that have never been observed until is confirmed by a test at LHC on January, July 4th, 2012. Interesting. So this Higgs boson, or I think I'm saying that right, is an elusive high mass particle, which is the very thing that gives mass to all matter in the universe. Basically, it's what allows things to physically exist, this God particle. So they're hoping that they can continue to create these god particles and blast them together and, and try to create some new shit hmm. and actually as we're talking about this I, I think the large hadron collider is actually being scheduled to receive an upgrade to high luminosity uh, sometime after 2022 so in the near future like they do test they do stuff like pretty regularly but they're going to be shutting it down pretty soon but basically scientists hope that one day They'll be able to use the Large Hadron Collider to peek into the realms of dark matter and scour potential hidden dimensions of the universe. That's the other part of it, too, is like not only are they like like obviously creating these like black holes and things like that, but they're they're figuring out they're trying to see if they can possibly move time backwards or if they can um, if they can see. I don't know how you would see, but discover that there's, you know, different dimensional planes or worlds that we could potentially see and go into i mean who knows oh, that is literally hurts my head <laughs> how are they gonna do that that's crazy what if they never come out this is like stranger things it is it's actually a lot like stranger things isn't that like a different dimension that they like open the portal to yeah. a different it's kind of cern is kind of like yeah it's very similar things. and it's underground yeah it's underground they have it portal it's been portaled into another world yeah. Another interdimensional world. Oh, God. I so, love so obviously, things. like when people when you know this about CERN, a lot of people start, you know, get going and like, oh, well, if they can do that, then maybe they can, you know, portal into another world. Or yeah, maybe they already travel. have. Or, yeah, you know. I, I talked about CERN in my John Teeter video, except I didn't know what CERN was. And fucking in my notes, it said that it's an American company and it's not. They're not even in the list of countries that like are part of it. Yeah. So, but I said it's an American company in my video. <laughs> People were like, oh, uh, no. Yeah. yeah. It's like, I didn't really know what it was. It was my first time hearing about it when I was researching for that video. But yeah, it was talking about them creating these black holes and that maybe they could microscopic time travel. black holes. They're, they're literally there for 16 to like 30 seconds and then they're wow. gone and then they collapse. So the idea is that maybe you could time travel through it and then. What it, would happen if you went, if something went through it and then it collapsed? We don't know. No one's ever been through a black hole. Wow, that's so well, weird. and that's the thing is like we like they they don't have the capability to create and first of all they wouldn't want to do that because a black hole sucks everything into it that's near it, right? So they wouldn't want to make anything bigger than a microscopic black hole. If they even yeah, if they made a, a black hole the you know the size of a basketball, we'd be fucked. The whole planet would get sucked into it. It would probably be able to exert enough pull that it would pull the entire life as we know it into it and either destroy it or take us somewhere else, which will lead us into what we're going to talk about next. And that's the Mandela effect and possibly other universes. 
But before we do that, we want to thank our last sponsor today, Hunt a Killer. If you're listening to this podcast, you probably love stories about true crime and investigative journalism. If you're like me, you probably get immersed in the story and often find yourself trying to solve the case. Well, we have something to satisfy the detective in you. I mean, who doesn't want to play detective, especially if you're a true crime fanatic like we are? This is something you definitely want to check out. So Hunter Killer will become your new favorite obsession. It is a monthly subscription game where you yourself become a detective immersed in a murder mystery. Each month you'll receive crime scene photos, evidence, motive, and suspect information that you'll need to use to solve a crime. It's so interactive and convincing that it looks and feels real from the newspaper clippings to the clothing left at the crime scenes. And if you think it will be easy... Haha, think again. You'll be it's racking not. your brain to solve the mystery and anxiously awaiting the next box of clues. I did their like original one back a little while ago, like two years ago or so. And it was it was different than this, how they have it set up now. But it was really hard. Like I spent all, like hours on the first one. It is it's hard. very hard. I mean, it's meant to, to take a, you know, months of your time. But it's something really fun that you can do together, like on a date night or with friends. Um, and you can swap theories about it. And literally they send you a manila envelope and it's got a bunch of stuff in it, including, um, you know, things from private investigators. Like the box that we received is about, um, a victim named Charles McDonough, <laughs> Donahoe, Donahue, I think a pharmacist <laughs> in Chestnut Falls. He was murdered on the night of his high school reunion. This isn't a real person, though, right? No, no, no. no, no right. No. This is a game. No, this is a game. Yeah. I did. I just. I didn't know if they, maybe they started doing real cases or something. No, no. no. Why would they do that? That'd I don't be know. Terrible. I don't know. I was just wondering. But yeah, so they they give you all the information. Like I've got a map. I've got a, a police reports. I have. I think I have even like a medical examiner's report yeah, that you get really to review. Cool. It goes in tons of depth into the case. Like, it does, and the internet's like fair game. Like they hide stuff in it. Like. Something that you have to like, yep. you'll be like, oh, maybe I should look this up. You like I literally had to website, look up certain things. Type in a password that's included on here yeah. to get some more information. Like all of the different clues that they give you, they give you actual items that you have to look at mm -hmm. and, you know, pulled up to the light to see if there's clues. Like you really, it, yeah, it's it very really interactive fun. and very fun. And if you're into this kind of stuff, I mean, you know, it's really fun. It might be right up your alley. So. Over 60,000 people have joined Hunter Killer's online community. They have over a thousand five star customer reviews. Again, they've got forums. They've got, even if you're doing this by yourself, you can go and connect with people up on the forums and share clues with each other because you're all trying to solve it together. And you will need to use the forums probably. It's hard. <laughs> it is very hard. It's tempting. It's very tempting to want to get on the forums. I try not to for most of it, but it's hard. Yeah. It's yeah. hard. <laughs> but that's what makes it fun. So it's really fun. Right now, just for our listeners, you can go to huntakiller.com slash milehire for 20% off your first box. They only accept 200 members per day. So hurry to take advantage of this yeah, offer. it's exclusive. It's an exclusive Hunt a Killer Club. That's huntakiller.com slash milehire for 20% off your first box. Huntakiller.com slash milehire. See if you have what it takes to get into the mind of a serial killer and solve the mystery. Definitely check that out. All right. Oh, we're Mandela getting into effect. Mandela. Yeah, this is this is interesting because this is what sent me into this whole world. I started with a video on the Mandela effect before like anyone talked about it on YouTube. And I think maybe Shane did like years before me, but I had never heard of him talk about it. I heard someone talk about it and I was like, this is crazy. I have to tell people on the internet. And then it like it blew up. It did. Yeah. It became like an internet phenomenon, I feel yep, like. It totally did. But yeah, barely anyone knew about it when I made the video and I like did this whole quiz thing. It's so interesting, but this is what really got me into conspiracies and what convinced me to change my channel over because it was so fascinating. It's very me. fascinating. And it's it's I mean, I'm sure, as you know, it's it's extremely trippy to think about. And for those that don't know what the Mandela effect is or how it came about or how it got its name, the Mandela effect was given its name by Fiona Broom, who seemed to remember hearing about the death of Nelson Mandela on the news while he was in prison in the 1980s. In reality, though, Mandela survived until late 2013 and did not even become president of South Africa until 1994. So could this be a result of just one person incorrectly remembering a historical event or a cultural icon propagating their misinterpretation? But it's not just one person. The, what really makes it a Mandela effect isn't just if like sometimes people tweet me and be like, oh, I thought something was spelled this way. Oh, Mandela effect. Right. No, it's only a Mandela effect if. 
tons of other people also remember that. Like it's a phenomenon for a yeah, bunch of like, like obviously people thing. misremember things. Yeah. But this whole the woman who it was she wasn't the only one who thought he died right. in the 1980s. A bunch right. of people remember hearing that. In fact, I thought I learned that in high I school. I did too. I did too. If I you asked most sworn people, I remembered learning about him dying in this jail cell. Mm -hmm. And then I got all confused. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm so confused. About so, it, but, yeah, yeah. so that that's exactly what it is, though. It's mass amounts of people who all remember an event or something being totally different than it is now. Mm -hmm. So another another of the biggest examples, which I think people believe could be evidence of a multiverse in some way. In which possibly events this is evidence, Josh, okay. have washed over into ours and created subtle nuances, subtle, subtle nuances in the time space continuum. Like little things. So for the biggest example, if you've never heard about it, is Bernstein Bears or the Berenstein Bears. Yeah. The Berenstein Bears. I always heard of it, Berenstein. Yeah. I, oh, for sure. Berenstein I feel like Bears. most people thought it was the Berenstein Bears. Turns out it's the Berenstein Bears with an A. And so many people, I mean, there's like people have found things where it's written like that. Yeah. VHS is where it has it on it. Like, it's really, really weird. And I definitely remember Steen. Like, I don't know anyone who said the Bernstein Bears. I don't remember anybody either. I don't know. It's weird. It is very weird. Another big one is in Star Wars. Um, at Empire the end, Strikes Back, I think. Yeah. When Darth Vader says, Luke, I am your father. But he actually says, no. I am your father. What the hell? Like, I've never even seen that movie, and that's what I thought it was. <laughs> I'm not I've a Star seen Wars that, fan. Yeah, I've seen that quite a bit. That's really, yeah, really I bizarre. think it's a very straight back that he says that. Yeah, Luke, Doesn't I am matter. your father. No, I am your father. Doesn't even matter. I don't remember. But yeah, that's no, what people say, father. though. Like, Luke, I am your father. Like, people like, quote that all the time. People say that. There are movies where they literally quote it, and they must be getting it wrong. Like, everyone was just wrong yeah, on it. Yeah, yeah. It's I remember so straight up like toys at the store, like Darth Vader toys yeah. would say, Luke, I am your father. Yeah. Like, it yes. Would, it would do that. It was never, no, I am your father. Like, yeah, what? no. It was always, he always said his name, Luke. Yes. But then if you go and watch it now, like you go it watch the movie, it says, clearly, no, I am your father. Yeah. And it's not even like you could have possibly heard Luke. Doesn't like, make sense. it's so weird. So it's very, very weird. And then the other uh, big one is the famous protester at uh, Tiananmen Square, the tank man. It was this guy who was standing in front of a tank with grocery bags in his hand. And many remembered him literally dying because he got ran over by a tank. But in fact, he was not run over and there's no evidence of it. But many, many, many people remember this happening. Really? Yeah. I've never heard of that one. Really? Yeah, you have. You've no. definitely heard of it. Mm -mm. No? Never heard of that. Really? Well, it's it's definitely one of the big ones. He yeah. was grocery bags? He was like protesting, so he had a bag on his side, and he was literally standing in front of a tank. And a lot of people remember the tank just literally like rolling right over him. And, and he Because it was moving, yeah. No. There's huh. no evidence, at least, of it. Like, there's no video footage of him being run over by it. I think Weird. he moves out of the way. Whoa. So it's this idea of there's these little, so, yeah, nuances. But it's like... Wouldn't there be, you know, why haven't we found so many other subtle nuances and that isn't just pop culture or like, you know, why isn't there a subtle nuance about the way that the toilet bowl flows water around it or, you know, some more stuff like that. But that's why like, would that change? That's not a sub. That's a massive change. <laughs> <laughs> the Which way, way water, the water flows. flows. <laughs> that's a big thing. It's supposed to be little things that could have changed. Like, I think. OK, so basically the idea is. With the Bernstein Bears as an example, the family is named Berenstain. The two, the husband and wife that wrote Which these books. If you don't books, know, they're bears. They're not. No, they're not bears. Oh, they're real a, yeah, people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be the no, they're actual wrote bears. <laughs> bears wrote the story. <laughs> no. Okay, they're a husband okay. and wife Bernstein family. Okay. Right, right, right. So the Mandela effect. People that believe in the Mandela effect think that maybe it's possible that. When they were the man, the Mandela effect would be the subtle change would be that if they came to Ellis Island or something or whenever their name was made, it was changed to burn stain instead of steam just by whatever the person was feeling like, you know, how at Ellis Island, they would just give you names 
Like they took my name. It was something crazy. My parents' real name and made it into something more simple. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of people do that. Yeah. Like your name was probably like crazy. No, no mine wasn't. It wasn't. Mine okay. had already been changed prior. Okay. So, but a lot of them do change it for you. Like at Ellis Island, they would do that. So that's what people think is that maybe it's something like that. Like it was changed. But that's not that bit complicated of a name. Why would they do that? Change one letter too. Or maybe they, no, e they were a. given a name and maybe it was something different oh, was never and then e. they were given this. Gotcha. And it was an E one time and then in another universe it was an A. See, that's that like, that's kind of what though. the theory is. Though. I'm just trying to explain yeah, it. Yeah. No, so I know. that maybe there was this slight change and that their name was Bernstein in another universe. Or could we all just be fucking dumb and, and not remembering it right? that's a possibility for sure <laughs> like is it possible that all of our memories are just completely jogged because of something like maybe who knows maybe some There's external so many force, examples though you know had an effect on our brains and we just but it's it's very it is weird i will say that there it is so very many bizarre. examples too like there we, are. Can, we can't even get into them all we should definitely do a podcast where we like just go over all the mandela effects it'd be fun <laughs> I feel like that'd be fun to do with like a group of people. Yeah. Yeah. See if everybody remembers the same things. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, man. I, it's a weird one. But anyways, considering the Mandela effect, if it, if it is real and there is some type of, you know, crossover from another universe or something, many people believe that CERN may be responsible for creating the Mandela effect. It could be. Because... When or, you know, since CERN was established, these physical or these particle physics experiments are causing the world to shift into parallel universes and they may not even know it. That's the thing It's like maybe CERN doesn't even know the extent of the damage, I guess you would say, that they're doing to the current state of reality. Like, so if you think about this idea of a multiverse or this idea of that, there's an infinite number of universes that all coincide next one, you know, next to each other. And you think about that, is there a possibility that this, you know, there's another universe in which everything is much like it is here, except it's slightly different in some way, shape or form. Is it That's possible what it is. That's what the Mandela that effect thinks. that universe, you know, I, I've always thought of like universes being bubbles. And if you have multiple universes, maybe the bubble, sometimes they touch or, you know, they kind of cross over a little bit and maybe when they cross over, something happens in the time space continuum where it just kind of like bleeds through things. That's the idea at least. Yeah. I, yeah. We don't know how that works. That's just, yeah, clearly we don't know how that works. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, what, what could possibly go wrong if they were, uh, you know, doing that or what if they were able to open up a black hole in Europe, could they tap into another dimension? You know, if they've already done that, have they tapped into another dimension and it's had some type of effect on our current dimension. What's also interesting about CERN is that Stephen Hawking, before he died, actually warned us about the work that CERN was doing and about the God particle uh, in particular. He's, he was quoted by saying that the God particle found by CERN could destroy the universe. Hawking wrote this in a uh, preface to a book named Starmus, a collection of lectures by scientists. The Higgs Boston could become unstable at very high energy levels and have the potential to trigger a catastrophic vacuum decay, which would cause space and time to collapse, and we would not have any warning to the dangers. He continued. So he he basically was like, these guys are somebody as smart as Stephen Hawking literally warned us about what they're doing at CERN because there are risks that seems like aren't being really taken that seriously it doesn't I mean, even seem like it's being like monitored no well anything. that's the thing and, and there's no like democratic democratic process to it they just do their own thing like there's oh, nobody so that controls freaky. them because they're a multi-country conglomerate type thing not only did stephen hawking warn us about it but neil degrasse tyson was quoted on his star talk radio program that the experiment could literally cause the planet to explode oh that's so scary when he, he's, he was quoted by saying, ask yourself, how much energy is keeping it together? Then you put more than that amount of energy into the object. He said it will explode. Why is he? Oh, my God. Why are they doing this then? Because it's uh, that's the thing. I mean, why are they doing this? What are they doing? Are they doing something? Are they really doing it for research or is there other, you know, 
theories, conspiracies out there as to what their what the true purpose of CERN is. Now, this is where we're going to start getting into some, you know, tinfoil hat stuff here. All right. All right. Let's so put the tinfoil hats on. Here's the T for um, the location. So CERN is located in a town in France or partially situated in a town in France called St. Genus Poily. The name Poily or Puli comes from the Latin word Apollyacum, Apollyacum, and is believed that in Roman times a temple existed in the honor of Apollo. And the people who live there believe that it is a gateway to the underworld. So the CERN facility just so happens to be situated near a town in France called literally the Apollo underworld God. Wow. The meaning of it, of the word. Okay, but they're just near it? Yeah, well, they're situated like underneath it. They're underground. So, I mean, okay. they have some buildings above ground, but they're situated near that 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 town. Okay. Again, just a coincidence or okay. something more there. I mean, who knows? Now, when you start looking at the CERN logo, this is where a lot of you know conspiracy people will kind of go a little crazy because when you look at the logo, it looks to me, when you first glance at it, like a six or a nine you know, or six upside down. It's a nine now. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's I had a nine to. now. <laughs> but a lot of people speculate if if you look at the logo, it says CERN, and then there's like what well, looks like nines or sixes, kind of like intertwined yeah, with each other. That. I but, see it. It looks like three different sixes and right. different like. Yeah. There you go. A lot of people think that it's six six six, 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 six. the mark of the beast, which indicates the devil shit apocalypse apocalyptic it, the 666 mark of the beast comes from revelations in the bible about the end of the world why day that's coming what is it what does the bible say about 666 in it it's the mark of, it's literally the mark of the beast or the mark of the most what is it what do they say about it, it just says 666 is the mark of the beast that's what the bible says no that's what the actual that's like what the devil is essentially it's like it represents the devil and his forces like essentially symbol? the end of the bible is literally a clash versus good versus evil Jesus. it's literally a final battle between satan and all of his beasts and minions and demons versus god and they throw down and god defeats damn defeats him. damn so a lot of people think that cern may be somehow connected to some type of satanic type situation oh my god, that's so weird because their <laughs> logo indicates that but okay. The, the more rational explanation for it is that it's actually the outline of a schematic of a, a synchrotron, which is a type of particle accelerator. Oh, okay. Could <laughs> so, be. Yeah. Yeah, could be. Now, what's one of the most interesting things to me about CERN is that outside of their headquarters, they have a statue of the Hindu god Shiva, which if you don't know about the Hindu god Shiva... He is a complex character. He may represent goodness, benevolence, and serve as the protector, but he also has a darker side as the leader of evil spirits, ghosts, and vampires, and as the master of thieves, villains, and beggars. He is also associated with time, and particularly as the destroyer of all things. So if you think about that for oh, a minute, it's like, my God. again, this is why people are kind of going nuts about it, is because why would they have that? And all these things are making the connecting the dots. You know, you start connecting the dots. They're smashing things open. They're opening things. They're trying to access other dimensions. Or are they opening a literal gate, the gates of hell? Like some people believe that. Some people oh believe God. that they're well, like. Why do they have that. that? It's so weird. They have it because it was actually a gift from India. Oh. Celebrating their long association with India starting in the 1960s, especially if it re like resembles protection. Well, that's the thing, too, is it, it doesn't just represent destruction. OK, the plaque alongside the statue explains that Lord Shiva danced the universe into existence. Existence motivates it, but will ex eventually extinguish it. So in Hinduism, the universe is thought to regenerate in cycles every two uh, was that two point one billion years, essentially. And Shiva destroys the universe at the end of each cycle, which then allows for a new creation. So that's what that's what kind of people are thinking, too. Wow. Oh, that's really weird. She destroys the entire universe or he. It's a he. Yeah, it's confusing. It's okay. a he. So is that a sign of anything? I don't know. I mean, they have a valid explanation for it, that it was a gift from India. And I get the whole premise of it that, you know, 
they're trying to, you know, if you think about it as like an innocent gift, it kind of makes sense. Like they're giving yeah. them a thing, a God that represents the universe, the universe and, into existence. Yeah. I mean, they're studying the universe, so yeah. it kind of makes sense. Yeah, that does But make the whole sense. idea of it being a God that all ultimately destroys the universe plays into the whole conspiracy that so CERN is trying to like Shiva end also the world. creates the universe too? Yeah. So it's like, I bring you in the universe, I'll take you out. Actually, I don't know if, if he actually creates the universe, but he allows it to uh, be reborn, like be remade. We yeah. heard. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. So another thing people think is CERN is opening up portal to other dimensions. One year after CERN's grand opening, Sergio Bertolucci, former director for research and scientific computing of the facility, grabbed headlines when he told a British tabloid the super collider could open otherworldly doors to another dimension for a very tiny lapse of time, mere fractions of a second. However, that may be just enough time to peer into this open door, either by getting something out of it or sending something into it. Interesting. This is somebody from CERN, director of research. Dude. They are. They're pushing the boundaries here. They're going deep. They're going Yeah, in. clearly. Imagine what could happen. I mean, if you do you believe in interdimensional beings? Like, do you think there's other beings that exist on other dimensions? And if there are, then if you access this other dimension that we can't access right now do you create an you know kind of like stranger things think about stranger things how uh you know the creature comes through mm -hmm. into their dimension through that portal right so could cern really be doing open something thing. exactly like that opening a portal oh or have an active open portal somehow some way into another dimension allowing whatever's on the other side to come through it's the same kind of thing with like uh like the Avengers and stuff, you know, like that. The, oh, right, the, right, the right, portal right. opens up and they like access it in the sky. Yeah. Again, back to Hollywood, like throwing yeah. out all these ideas. We got to do like a podcast just about like Hollywood and it, how yeah. it influences like event. Like it's, yeah. it's weird. Mm -hmm. It seems like it almost predicts things a lot. It's very weird. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Is, is it something like that happening? And this uh, director of research went on to say that. Of course, after this tiny do uh, moment, the door would again shut, bringing us back to our normal four-dimensional world. It would be a major leap in our vision of nature. And of course, there there would be no risk to the stability of our world. Of course, he says that. There will be no risk if, we, if it closes right back up. We should be fine. How do you know? But naturally, this comment has triggered fears that the CERN Collider could unwittingly invite unwanted visitors from other time-space dimensions. Like, what if there's, you know, interdimensional aliens or something in another dimension? We open this portal, they come through and literally take over the planet or destroy us or anything like that. Hopefully, hopefully that would happen and maybe there'd be some other, you know, more friendly interdimensional beings on the other side that might come through and say hello. <laughs> Just come out and be like, what's up? <laughs> yeah, I feel like the chances of them being nice are pretty slim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I know. So the other part of this, too, is that CERN's particle accelerator could be capable of, like, warping time space or time travel. So the Large Hadron Collider created a time warp. Oh, this is super interesting, actually. You definitely want, want to hear about this. This is, this is interesting. So the, this is a theory, again. So the Large Hadron Collider created a time warp that sent a passenger jet thousands of miles off course in the blink of an eye and caused a massive power blackout, is the claim. So the report said that CERN scientists began a series of experiments during which they discovered their testing was distorting our Earth's magnetic field and had shot off a time wave towards the core of the planet. Tracking showed the wave veered exactly towards the sun gate high in the Bolivian Andes Mountains, the report said. The report added the initial time wave spawned by LHC erupted from the sun gate and headed out towards space above South America. The wave then glanced into the path of a plane, which was ready to begin its descent into Santa Cruz, Bolivia, but then found itself instantly and mysteriously over the skies of Santa Cruz and in Spain, over 5,500 miles away. What? A real, real. This is a real thing. What? That's insane. 
All 170 passengers and the crew of flight A7301 were safe, and after 17 hours on the ground in Spain, they departed back to Bolivia. The what? bizarre plane incident is said to have happened on November 1st, 2009. A day later, CERN lost power at the Large Hadron Collider and announced some days later in a statement that a bird had dropped a piece of baguette onto the machinery, <laughs> causing it to shut down. What? This is real. They the whole freaking giant super machine we were just talking about got shut down because a bird flew over, which I thought this thing was underground. And dropped one. some baguette. Dropped in? a baguette into their machine. Yeah, I, it's underground. What? I don't know. I don't understand how. Like this whole thing is confusing to me. So I don't know, but the, I on this from CERN, on the CERN website they were talking about how a baguette shut their machine down. So the report added that after this mysterious event, certain scientists shut down the Large Hadron Collider, blaming their failed experiment on this bird dropping this piece of bread. After which their director for research, Mr. Sergio, said that he warned that the Large Hadron Collider machine may, be, may possibly create or discover previously unimagined scientific phenomena. So they literally time traveled. Or unknown unknowns such as an extra dimension. Oh my God. So where are these 170 people? Are they walking yeah, around saying I fucking time traveled? I don't know. How did this happen to me? What the hell? I don't know. I don't think they know. Why isn't there more news coverage on this? My God. That is insane. So in 2009. Yeah, I remember 2009. I don't remember this. So the report goes on to say, and other ones went on to claim that even after the Large Hadron Collider was shut down, dimensional dis, uh, distortions created in South America by this time wave continued and caused the Gateway of the Sun monolith to send out what Russian scientists likened to a digital communication. This was said to have been blasted towards thousands of pyramids and other ancient sites in Brazil and the Andes region, leading to a massive power outage plunging tens of millions of people into darkness. Wow. So this time, so what's crazy about, and this is again, claims we can't confirm this part of the story, <coughs> but if a time wave really did, and it had this sort of effect, it essentially somehow it ignited <coughs> the pyramid structures across the planet. Oh my God. Which then in turn cr created this massive <coughs> blackout that actually happened. That is insane. Yeah. I can't it? believe I've never heard of this. So how much of this is true? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How much? I thought it was true. Is it not? Just listen. So it's what is true is that CERN had been testing their large Hadron Collider on November 1st, 2009, after it was out of action for more than a year following a previous power failure. It's also true. CERN had to postpone the test runs of the LHC on November 2nd, 2009, after a bird dropped bread Okay. Into an ex okay, it dropped it into an external electricity supply, cutting power to the machine. So okay, they have the power sense. probably above the surface. I guess that makes sense somehow. I don't know. <laughs> How does Bert get bred into a super know, nine billion really dollar machine? Come that on. Seems really weird. There are also reports online that flight A7301 ended up at Santa Cruz in Spain instead of uh, the same in Bolivia with 170 passengers on board with no explanation initially given. However, there was no suggestion in these reports of any time anomalies. In fact, the flight was said to be five hours into the journey over the Atlantic when pilots were denied access to Brazilian airspace and had to return, taking a further six hours to reach the diverted airport. So that's the official story of what happened. Oh, okay. Is that they were denied access to the so airspace. that's the official story. Okay. And then they just turned around and flew like 5,000 miles. You know, it doesn't make sense, though. Like, it's definitely it doesn't make sense. weird. I'd be pissed off as a passenger. Mm -hmm. It's also true that on November 11, 2009, a power cut affected millions of people in Brazil for two hours and in Paraguay for 20 minutes. Again, this report was uh, credited to a huge hydroelectric dam suddenly malfunctioning. So, again, this is a theory that somebody put together based upon the evidence that they had. And that was what was happening with the Large Hadron Collider on those days. And it happened to coincide when, when this plane all of a sudden diverted out of nowhere and ended up in another airport mysteriously. 
because they couldn't get into airspace but doesn't make a ton of sense. I haven't heard of that happening that often, Yeah, especially this day and age. While also at the same time, a power cut happening, affecting millions of people. So I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's enough evidence to say that was it for sure, but it is interesting to think about if they really do have this type of effect. Like what if when they're doing these, these tests, they're actually are sending out these, you know, waves of, of energy or, um, what do they call them? Time waves, time distortion. And there actually are somehow distorting time a little bit and allowing thing, you know, allowing time to either slow down or speed up or we don't know what they're fucking with. I mean, we don't yeah. know what the, the results of, of their experiments are, are really doing. That's and, really, really trippy. Isn't it? Yeah. It's like really makes me feel uneasy thinking they're just doing this. I feel bad for the people that live over in that part of the world. I mean, yeah. it's like, yeah, you don't know what they're doing under there. <laughs> yeah. That's really weird. And nobody's real. I mean, it doesn't really seem like they have a boss or who's, who's orchestrating <laughs> yeah. it or who's, we don't know really. That is so weird. I feel like the top of the top, the elite must be involved in it. Like there's nothing that gets, that's well, this why powerful. Are, why that's are they doing this in the first them. place? Like what's the reason other than to get answers, but it seems like $9 billion to just get some answers about the universe. Maybe. I mean, would that be something that we yeah, would do? Yeah, I mean, think? I think so. Yeah. If there's, if I mean, don't we want to know the answers of the universe? We That's do. like could explain a lot. Definitely a good investment in Is the long term. Is it worth the risk, though? I don't know if it's worth the risk. Is it worth the risk of? I'm the wrong person to ask. Creating about a that. black hole and potentially risking the entire planet. I don't know. I mean, if, the, if they're able to do microscopic black holes and they're continuing, and that's the thing is in 2022, they're increasing the intensity of it. They're increasing the power of it. They're just beefing it up more and more and more. It's insane. And I mean, like when people that are smarter than us talk about this, they, they, their reasoning is like, there's no way that this machine, no matter how much we try to make it powerful, are we ever going to be able to create a black hole or something that's going to be able to like, destroy us but it, but then again i you know stephen hawking yeah was talking about the the god particle and how we have to be careful with that and you know we start firing those around and stuff you could literally there's a lot of things that could happen and we we just don't know the full extent of what what those <laughs> what the you know downsides would be so weird but yeah i mean some of the other some other people think that there's been like there's a there's a lot of like fake shit that goes on with this too because it's a conspiracy of course so there there was actually a video of like people they said it was a prank of course uh, we don't know I don't I don't know the full details of it but there's video I think online somewhere of like a human sacrifice being taken place in front of the statue and stuff and is it outside real? of certain no you, oh, it's been okay. debunked okay. okay yeah it's fake as far as we I know. meant like does it look real like yeah it looks it like looks legit I mean it looks like Somebody went through the trouble to make it look like they're they're like fire a bunch of black hoods and they're like God, I don't I mean, know. I mean, nobody some, died. I feel like but, I don't know enough about the sketchiness behind CERN to like make a full decision. Well, nobody There's like knows more. the sketchiness exactly behind it. to like fully know. We don't know their true and like what the true intent is. What's the end result for CERN? Like, what is what is it that they're trying to do other than smash particles together and see what the hell happens? I mean, that's what it seems like is happening. Yeah. That they're just one of the one of the last things that I'll, I'll mention is there's this allegation that CERN, if it's a part of this whole conspiracy of trying to, you know, essentially aid in opening up the gates of hell or or some people believe that it, they're trying to build a stargate or a portal to another time or place to allow the return of the Anunnaki which we've talked about the Anunnaki in the Sumerian podcast, wow. which were the old, powerful, ancient gods, mm -hmm. potentially extraterrestrial. Yeah. That That's such an interesting topic. We're here to, you know, yeah, we got to do a whole podcast on the book of Enoch. Um, there's a ton of shit with that, but are we, yeah. Could they be trying to bring the old gods back that potentially created mankind or aided us in our early process? I mean, who knows? Who really knows? And if they were able to bring them back, would they come in peace or could they come back and be like, what you guys did is complete shit, destroying everything.
Oh my God. So again, they, like yeah. CERN's like certain, the conspiracy theories associated with CERN are very doomsday, very apocalyptic yeah. and like world ending. Mm -hmm. But then again, that may not be true at all. And it could be something truly exciting, like breaking into another universe, breaking yeah. into another dimension or it is like important learning research, about black for holes. Sure. Yeah. Very well, black hole research, I think, is some of the most important research we need. I mean, we were just talking about interstellar travel at the beginning. And uh, the article that I read about interstellar travel is that uh, scientists are really trying to learn about black holes. And they think that we seriously might be able to some in some way travel through a black hole because that's the whole thing is a black hole um, could be a wormhole, which in turn connects to and connect comes out like a wormhole. <laughs> you go through the hole, you end up in another part of the yeah. universe or it's like, a, space. yeah, it's like when you like folding paper, it's right. like how I always remember Fold paper, it. pencil through it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's so weird. So who knows? I mean, who knows what's really going on at CERN and, and what they're, they're really doing. I mean, uh, the official explanation is they're doing scientific experiments on particle physics and yeah, they're trying to make some new discoveries, figure out what, what makes up the universe. What is the universe? What is this fabric around us? I would love to know what does matter. God, it would be so interesting to talk to someone over there though that knows some shit. Oh yeah, get the inside scoop. Mm -hmm. God, I wish we could. That would be cool. Maybe. Maybe we'll just go over there and just like try to get in and <laughs> just meet with show up. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's crazy though. It is, and they're making that hadron collider even more powerful yeah. soon. Who knows? Who knows what'll happen? The future is so crazy. If you learned anything during this episode, you learned the future yeah. is going to be fucking insane. Buckle up, guys. It's going to get real. Yeah, buckle the fuck up. Big things are happening. It's going to happen. Something's going to happen. Something big's going to happen, good or bad. You just got to be mentally prepared for it the best you can. Ain't it true? But yeah, we'll wrap up today's ep episode now. And uh, yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed learning about CERN. I did. That was really interesting. I, 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 it's something I've known about for a while and I just thought it'd be really interesting to talk about because. Mm -hmm. well, that, and that's why Josh like really leads episodes like this. Like I, I get more involved in the crime ones, but Josh yeah. is the real like ex. Like he, this is his passion, his hobby, yeah. his, he's always been into this. Yeah. I haven't always been into this stuff. I'm kind of new to this whole world actually. Yeah. Like crime yeah. I've been interested in forever, but like, yeah, the conspiracies and all of this is aliens like the last. Yeah. Three year, two, three years. So I don't know as much as you because you've been into this since we were like, yeah, yeah I've a, been long about a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've been, I've always loved space and all this. So you just do such a better job of explaining things. It's so hard for me to even wrap my mind around this stuff. It's so complicated. It and is confusing. very complicated. And, and I mean, I do my best, but it, it, it does require an expert to really understand, yes. f, you know, particle physics and stuff. Like I yeah. can't explain. Yeah you know, complex physics. Well, you did a good job of explaining. Like I would do such a bad job of explaining <laughs> most of this stuff because I don't understand it. Like how can you Gravity, explain go. something to someone when you barely understand it yourself? Like I can explain crime yeah. to people because it's like facts. It's, yeah, yeah. you know, it's struck, but this is like su it's weird concepts to grasp and a lot of who knows and crazy. But that's why this is the mile higher podcast. <laughs> and hopefully you guys enjoyed going a We're mile higher with us today. Come together. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for joining us today. If you enjoyed the episode, we really appreciate it. If you subscribe on iTunes and YouTube or both, if you do both, that'd be nice. And yeah, <laughs> we will see you guys next week. Stay safe. And stay woke.